Thank you very much for uh, joining us here uh, in this afternoon and as we will hear from um, an esteemed uh, list and uh, a wonderful uh, and exciting new report from the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. I'd like to welcome everyone um, on behalf of ClimateWise at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership and the Association for the British Insurers. Um, we are now going to be more formally welcomed from the uh, council here um, of Glasgow City Region and I would like to invite Kevin uh, to the stage. Uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity. My name is uh, Kevin Rush, I'm the director of regional economic growth, as Bronwyn told you there. Um, and I'm delighted to have the chance to, to speak to you uh, here today about Glasgow's Green Print for Investment. Councillor Aitken, the leader of the council, will, will come and speak about some of the wider work that, that Glasgow is doing uh, shortly. But if I could just give you a kind of introduction into to what we are seeking to do uh, in the, the year, years ahead. I would start by saying I think the city, is, as I'm sure you're aware, um, has had some pretty high-profile visitors in the last few days, from, from President Biden right through to President Obama later this week, from Greta Thunberg uh, right through to other world leaders. But for me, speaking to the insurance industry is by far bigger than any of those. Because... <laughs> and thank you very much. <laughs> um, my responsibility is, as, as some of you may know, my responsibility is for overseeing the, the development of Glasgow's economy. And actually, in all seriousness, our insurance industry is one of our strongest sectors when it comes to where our real growth opportunities are. The, co the location quotient that we have for insurance companies is the highest, actually, of any sector that we have. So I am genuinely delighted. I'm not saying if Biden was here, I maybe wouldn't go and speak to him. But I am delighted to have the chance to, to speak to you uh, today. So I don't know if someone has the slides. If... Great. Um, so if we just move on to the next one, that would be, be great. So one of the things that we've had to think about as we start to look at a new approach to investment within, within Glasgow is assessing, I guess, what the, the risks facing the economy of the city and all economies are these days. And some work was done, as many of you will know, by the World Economic Forum, which looked at the, the global risks landscape looked at all of the different risks that, that cities and, and major economies would face in the, the coming uh, years. And it wouldn't surprise anyone to know that uh, climate was the number one risk, both in terms of, of likelihood and, and impact. So we know that a failure to tackle the challenges that are coming for us is the number one thing that we have to focus on, even higher in this chart than infectious disease, which, as you know, has been a major issue for all of us in the last, the last two years. So failure to act is not an option for us. Can I have the next slide? Thanks. This speaks for itself, so I won't, uh, I won't talk about this one. Um, what this demonstrates, though, is that a lot of the risks that we face as an economy are interconnected. So climate cannot be seen just simply as something that you need green solutions for. It's not just about biodiversity. It's about the impact, the, the impact of the decisions that we have taken as business as usual has a major impact on that. So therefore, we have to think about things in a different way. The challenges that we face are products of the economic system that we've had, had in place. So therefore, we took a very conscious decision in Glasgow to look at a new approach. The next slide, please. So what this slide shows, and I think what I'm, I'm sure you've, you've heard a lot of in the last few days, <clears throat> is that we are well off target for the 2030 ambitions that the world has set itself. We're not going fast enough, we're not going quickly enough, and we're not making the changes that are required. What I would say is that some of the agreements in the last two days around things like deforestation, about methane reduction, I think have helped in the, the more modern parlance to flatten that curve somewhat. We're starting to make some, some real progress, but we know that we, we need to do more. And that means a systems change. That means that for those of us in things like economic development, we need to do things differently. And that's what the Green Print for Investment is designed to do. So, why green investment is needed is, is fairly straightforward. For us in Glasgow, we do tend to think of these things in numbers. Um, so we estimate the cost of moving to a net zero economy to be about 30 billion pounds. 30 billion pounds of direct investment needed in Glasgow to move us to a net zero climate resilient economy. But that's just for us. So if we take the major cities in the UK, and this is excluding London, you're looking at over £200 billion of investment is required to get to net zero. 
But the cost of inaction are even higher. The cost of inaction could be up to 2.5% of, of GVA, which in current figures would be £2 billion per annum for Glasgow. But actually, there's going to be some inflation by 2070. Those figures are going to be substantially higher than that. So there's an imperative on us to invest now in the things which can help make that difference. One of the things that we've had to give some serious thought to is the need for twin track investment. Neither the public sector or the private sector can do this on their own. In this very stage yesterday, Michael Bloomberg, who's got a few bob, stood. Even someone like Michael Bloomberg or Jeff Bezos or some of the billionaires who've been in the city, they don't have the investment required even to fix the challenge in Glasgow, never mind across, across the world. And neither does the public sector. We need to work in partnership over a very, very long period. That's about institutional investment, about pension funds, about very, very long-term patient capital investment. But you need a clear direction, a clear plan of what you, you're seeking to, to invest in. And it's about understanding what the different roles of different partners are in that regard. So for the public sector, it's about enabling infrastructure. It's the things that there isn't really any return on investment on that the private sector can then come in and generate some, some investment off the back of. So the dual roles that, that we have, and the green print I think is really crucial in terms of align, aligning the city's investment with the Paris, Paris Convention. Next slide, thanks. So what we chose to launch and what if Councillor Aitken had managed to get here before me, she would, have, she would have talked about, but she will talk about, is that last month she launched Glasgow's green print for in investment. A joined up programme of potential projects worth 30 billion pounds, which can transform Glasgow's economy from one which is still wrestling with its industrial past to a net zero future. A programme joined up, thought very, very carefully about, which will allow investors to come in from both the public and private sector and help us to secure that new net, net zero future that we all want. So the project's on there. I, I, hopefully this was circulated to you beforehand, but if not, we can send it to you afterwards. Uh, we have 11 projects in there ranging from a Glasgow Metro. Two words on there, so it looks very straightforward. It's a project which could potentially cost £15 billion, so it's not inexpensive. Um, but a range that, that go from that really ambitious, high-level metro energy retrofit project, right down to relatively smaller ones that are about £50 or £60 billion. So we have different types of projects for different types of investors and are keen to work with others on that. I won't go through all 11 because you would be incredibly bored if I did, um, but I'll just highlight just a couple just, just to show the, the diversity we, we have uh, within them. So the first of those is the Glasgow Metro, as I mentioned, hugely ambitious plans for us um, to join up the wider city region with a sustainable transport solution. Glasgow actually has the largest suburban rail network outside of London, but there are huge parts of the wider city region which aren't well connected. Um, and the, whether it's through the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation District, whether it's through connectivity to the airport in the whole southwest of the city. We believe that a new metro scheme, sustainable transport green metro scheme, could regenerate huge parts, could generate massive economic benefit. Um, and we believe that there's a real chance of, of a very positive announcement on that very shortly. We're expecting an outcome from the Scottish Government's strategic transport projects review. But this is the kind of project where I think there's a real role for the public and private sector to work together. So the public sector can invest in the land capture or the, the potential routes. Private sector partners in terms of delivery of a metro, whether it's through gain share, whether it's through looking at what the opportunities might for a special purpose vehicle, if you pardon the pun, to run it. This is the kind of thing where I think we can put together a business case collaboratively with the, the private sector. The second project I would, I would mention is the Home Energy Retrofit Scheme. We all know one of the biggest challenges that if we're going to meet our net zero ambitions is about our housing and energy use within housing. Glasgow is not unique in this, but our housing stock is incredibly energy inefficient. If we're going to meet the targets that have been set for all of us in the next 10 years, we have to invest incredibly heavily to look at our home insulation across the city region. And we estimate that in Glasgow, it's about 10 billion pounds. So that gives you a sense of what it's like in the wider, the wider economy. However, there are big opportunities in, in that, both in terms of COVID recovery, so skills opportunities for our young people to move into new sectors, supply chain opportunities for the SME 
base, tackling fuel poverty in some parts of the wider city and city region. And importantly, ourselves in Manchester are probably ahead of the game in this, but this is something that has been faced by all, by all cities and all city regions. So again, a really major plank of our green recovery. The third one, which is the small one, at 60 to 80 million pounds, so not insignificant in of itself. Um, those of you who've, who know the city or have been in the city in the last few days will know that we took a decision at some point in the past, uh, before I was born, uh, to run a motorway right through the heart of the city um, at Charing Cross. And what that means is there's a real disconnection between the west end of the city and, and the city centre. Very ambitious plans to look at creating a new park over the motorway, so capping the motorway, creating a new city centre park, which would improve active travel, it would link up the west end with, with the heart of the city. And again, one of those projects which is quite near business case development stage and one that we're quite keen uh, to, to take forward in the, the time ahead. Susan, you've arrived and everyone's looking at you now. I don't even know whether I should keep going. Um, but that's a, a huge project uh, for us as well. And then just a final one I, I would mention that's within the green print for investment, I think to show the different types of projects that we have. So with the metro, you've got one which is about connectivity and about regeneration of different areas. With retrofit, you've got one which is really genuinely targeted at your net zero ambitions. With uh, the M8 cap, you've got one which is about improving connectivity within the city centre and active travel. This one is just a straight green project. This is the Clyde Climate Forest initiative. We're going over the next 10 years, plan 18 million trees. I keep checking that figure because it just seems insane. Um, but we plan to plant 18 million trees across the wider city region, which will have a huge impact in terms of carbon offset, but also again creating new opportunities within, within that industry. So the green print is not a traditional economic development approach. You know, we know when we go and speak to investors and things like commercial real estate or hotel occupancy, exactly what they're looking for. They, they want to know straightforward, what's my yield on this? What's the return on investment I get? We know that there's a different approach that's required for this. And in the next slide, we'll just uh, touch on that. So in terms of what's next, the green print is there. Um, we know very much that this needs to be delivered in partnership. This is not going to be something that we just bring to people and say, can you give us a few billion out your back pocket and, and let us invest in this? But one thing that I'm sure you'll hear from Councillor Aitken when she speaks is that Glasgow isn't exactly short on ambition. You know, we've got the most ambitious net zero targets, I think, in the, the UK, certainly. We've got a £30 billion green print for investment. And in case you haven't noticed, we're hosting Bloody Cop. So there's a sense that the city is always keen to push. It's always keen to look at what the next opportunity is. So ambition is never, never an issue for us. Michael Bloomberg stood on this stage yesterday and I'm sure briefed, but described us as gallus, which we thought was quite nice to, to hear. So there is, there is a real level of ambition within, within the city. We know that our role as a city, though, is about that wider, wider stewarding role, about bringing together public and private sector together to look at how you invest in these opportunities. None of us can do it on, his, on our own. We can de-risk the investments to support institutional investment, to support pension funds and others to come in, but none of us can do that on our own. So we understand that our role is to look at this document as it evolves. Sometimes we'll add projects in, sometimes we'll take some out once we get the money for them, hopefully. Um, but we understand what our role is there. There's also a role, I think, for us, though, to improve the quality of sustainability credentials within business case projects. Still too often, any project we invest in needs a business case. And still too often, the sustainability bit is sticking a few solar panels on or separating your waste into paper and plastic. We understand that there's a different way in which we're going to approach that. We've appointed Kit England, who's our new green economy manager, and he is going to help everyone in the city to, to do that. Um, but that is a, a new way of, of thinking. Kit's just put his head on the table. That's a new way of thinking about how we will, we will deliver uh, these things. And crucially, I think it, for us, it's about removing barriers for the private sector to, to not get in the way, to understand what our role is. But I think the final point that I would, I would leave you with is that we understand that partnership is, is fundamental to this and we understand what our role is. President Biden said the other day that there was a role for the private sector, there was a role for markets to be involved in how we, we get to a net zero future and I think he was right. I'm sure as he wakes up this morning he's delighted that the wee bald guy from the council agrees with him. But actually that, that, that is the only way 
in which we can get to the net zero future that, that all of us are keen to do. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, to be here today and I hope the rest of the event goes well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Susan Eakin. and I'm the leader of Glasgow City Council. First of all, please accept my apologies uh, for not having been here at the opening. I hope that Kevin uh, has filled in for you very well, um, but we're, we're obviously going to have to do this a little bit backwards, uh, and you're going to have the welcome after the detailed presentation, uh, which isn't quite the normal way to do it. Uh, I am going to straight up blame the United Nations. Uh, I have never been involved in an event yet that they have organised that has started on time and today was no different. If they had started on time I would have been back here exactly at the right time to join you when I was supposed to. So um, apologies but also welcome. Uh, we are uh, delighted to be able to host you here uh, during this COP26. Uh, finally uh, there have been, to put it mildly, a few bumps on the road um, to uh, get to this COP but we are here now and we have uh, some serious work to do over the next couple of weeks um, and some enormous contributions to make. Um, the uh, banqueting hall here, our, our understated and subtle banqueting hall here in Glasgow City Chambers, um, has been a real hive of international activity and discussion and collaboration um, about the climate emergency and how different sectors um, and, and different cities uh, can contribute um, and play our part in delivering real action on the climate emergency. Um, the, uh, although we may not be Scotland's capital city, there is a sense that I think right now uh, Glasgow, for 12 days at least, is, is the world's capital city. We are the most talked about and the most focused on city in the world right now. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this building, um, the, the murals uh, around this wall, I'm not going to spend time talking about them. Um, I don't have the time for that today, unfortunately, because they are wonderful. But actually, my favourite is the one that's um, it's actually obscured by the chandelier, and it's, it's tucked up right on the back wall there behind the balcony. Um, and it's actually called Mother Glasgow Makes Her Plans for the City. And it feels to me particularly appropriate just now, because as you've just heard from Kevin... Uh, boy, are we making plans, um, probably more than at any time, uh, really since the, the immediate kind of post-war era in Glasgow. Uh, we are making plans for, for our people, for our city and for the planet uh, because um, that, that ultimately is what this is all about. We all share the same climate and action therefore needs to be taken everywhere, even if we in Glasgow think that um, we, are, we are somehow immune to this, then, then we are very wrong. Our decarbonisation contributes to um, the, uh, the, the lessening of um, the potential for climate catastrophe in Bogota just as much as, as Bogota uh, contributes to ours. Um, and so our plans are plans on a scale um, and of a precedence that we've, we've never really taken on in the city um, for a very long time. And COP, of course, gives us a platform to showcase Glasgow uh, that is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, Glasgow as an ambitious city, as Kevin just said, one that's drawing once again on the spirit of innovation and indeed social justice that's depicted in these murals round the wall, um, this time to build better lives and better places for all of our citizens and to learn the best from other cities around the world. It's our opportunity to ensure that this talented and inventive and globally connected city is in the best possible place to become a pioneer in the green economy. We have a compelling story to tell, uh, one which over the past 18 months, as I've been talking to global cities um, and international organisations as we've prepared on our extended road to COP26, has really resonated with them. 
the idea of us being this titan of the industrial age, ravaged then by the, the social and physical impacts of deindustrialization, but a city that has re-emerged to address and overcome the challenges and legacies of our past. And, as I said, a city with a plan, not only to adapt to and mitigate climate change, but really to modernise the very systems on which cities like ours depend day to day to address social challenges and to stimulate growth and prosperity. And your sector has a role to play in that, as indeed you have played a role uh, in our more recent history in that, that re-emergence. In many ways, you are a bit of the, of, um, the city's most well-kept secret. Uh, in some ways. There are, there are over 10,000 people working in Glasgow in the insurance and long-term saving sector uh, across the metropolitan region. And Glasgow City Centre is actually home to one of the highest concentrations of jobs in the UK from your sector. And it's, it's obviously, it's not something we shout about often enough, and I don't think it's something you shout about often enough either. We've all kept that, um, hidden our light under a bushel in that respect, uh, but the, the partnership and the collaborations, uh, I believe the potential for those that are possible from that economy of scale uh, that the insurance and savings sector has right in the city are absolutely fantastic. You're producing over a billion pounds worth of economic output annually in the Glasgow city region. You're absolutely cruci crucial to helping us to attract and retain the talent that we need to continue to have a buoyant city economy and actually has been one of Glasgow's great success stories in recent years. We have one of the highest graduate retention rates of any city in the UK um, and part of the reason for that is the really high quality jobs um, that long term important uh, established players in industries like uh, insurance and savings and financial services have established in the city over a number of years now in our international financial services district and beyond in fact. And it's notable, for example, that when we talk to firms who have had a presence in uh, our city, sometimes for a couple of decades, you're increasingly talking to us more about, about partnership, about collaboration, about how you exercise your civic responsibilities, how you can act to become more inclusive and sustainable employers, to invest in the decarbonisation of the public realm, to provide skills pathways into the jobs which you provide, which are already green jobs, of course, to a very significant degree, and the, the types of technologies that you are innovating in and that you're employing right here in Glasgow City Centre to put your sector at the cutting edge um, are also contributing to the, the kind of innovation that we require right across our entire economy to decarbonise and to create a genuinely green and sustainable economy for the future. And much of Glasgow's renaissance as a city has been down to that willingness to find solutions in collaboration with civil society, with academia and with business and industry. And as we enter this critical decade, this most critical decade for the city, for society, for humanity indeed, uh, those partnerships are going, now going to help us shape our response to the climate emergency. We need to widen the partnerships that we have to deliver the solutions, not just for climate, but for our sustainable and inclusive prosperity for in the future as a city. A prominent area for discussion, of course, uh, during these two weeks of COP, and indeed the one that is being focused on right now, uh, today, in the blue zone, is the financing of the net zero transition. 
The Committee on Climate Change has highlighted that much of the investment that's needed to support mitigation and adaptation does need to come from private investors. Um, and I think that a whole number of heads of government have emphasised the same message. Um, governments can't do this on their own. Councils certainly can't do this on their own. We need those collaborations around finance um, as well as around innovation and technology. And the pace and scale of climate action means that we need to build those partnerships soon and we need to build them effectively and quickly. We need to build a much better understanding between public and private sector of where our objectives can be aligned, how we can share um, and collaborate on serving our, our own needs and uh, working together to shape outcomes that work for all of us. Those partnerships with um, the finance sector, with pension funds, with institutional investors who have access to that long-term patient capital that's going to be really important here um, has to be mobilised um, right at the start of the next decade. And of course, the insurance sector absolutely falls into that category. It is in our collective interest to do so not just because we are all part of humanity on this shared planet, but because delivering benefits beyond the provision of capital and a return on investments is going to be something that's absolutely essential as cities attempt to decarbonise and build resilience. Those partnerships between local government and the insurance industry can play a substantial role, not just in keeping premiums affordable, which of course climate adaptation is going to be absolutely crucial to, but also expanding coverage to groups and individuals who are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and who are probably least likely to have taken out, for example, flooding insurance. And we can also, through partnership, help to create wider enabling conditions to understand how we move forward on uh, all sorts of issues from energy efficiency to flood resilience. The climate emergency needs innovators and facilitators to help create the foundations for change and to ensure that our financial systems are aligned with the ambitions of a net zero and climate resilient future but it also requires an innovative approach to relationships, to partnerships, to collaborations, as much as it will rely on financial and technological and scientific innovation. We in Glasgow, as the host city of COP, absolutely stand ready to play our part in that. We actively reach out to you um, as key players in this agenda that we have in front of us, this most crucial agenda over the coming years, and invite you to work with us, to talk to us, to be partners, genuine partners in this work. Um, we, I really hope that you'll be able to join us, that our event today is just the start of conversations over the longer term. As I say, we are delighted to be able to host you here today, um, and albeit belatedly, uh, I conclude again by giving you the warmest of Glasgow welcomes, and I hope that your time here in our city chambers today and at COP over the coming days proves to be productive and successful. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much to, to Kevin and Susan for the very, very warm welcome here uh, to this beautiful venue in this beautiful city. Um, I'm very appreciative too of the particular grounding it has given us as we moved into the, the next stage, into the, to launching the report, where we can talk and see where that, that sort of the, the rubber hits the road, that element of how do you then engage as a finance industry, as an insurance industry with policy makers and, and people who are, are looking at how can they change their cities to be more resilient, how can they move their industries to be aligned to net zero and asking how is it going to affect the daily lives of the people that they represent. So I think a very important grounding and I, I really do appreciate um, the, the words from both Kevin, Kevin and Susan there. I'm going to give a short introduction um, onto where the, the report that we're launching with you here today has come from.
from, um, to then pass to Anna, uh, the lead author, who will uh, provide more details, um, and then uh, we can move on. I'm just going to briefly mention, um, for anyone's information, uh, we're going to be filming today um, with an intent to provide that um, via our, our website later on, so if there's any issues, please let us know. Um, but yes, I'll now uh, pass to Anna to, to give a bit more information and to launch the report. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bronwyn, and all of you physically here supporting us in this launch today. We are very grateful to the Glasgow City authorities for such warm welcome, and to Alistair and the ABI team for inviting us to share this event, and also for all the background work that you have done to make today possible. Getting to this point today is the result of so many people, I could say around a hundred, collaborating with us very actively and significantly since September last year. Sadly, time doesn't allow me to mention everybody by name, but please give me two minutes to go through the teams involved. Of course, Bronwyn, Pascal, and the whole very committed Cambridge team supporting us here today, but also very involved throughout this year in the reviewing, the production, and the launch of this report. And this includes Climate Wise and his chair, Dominic Christian. Thank you to co-authors Jeff and Nigel for your time, work, and extraordinary journey that we have been through this year. Nigel, I can also see that you have your team here too. And thank you to our very impressive global advisory board of regulators, policy makers, and industry that contributed very generously with ideas and reviews. Thank you also to their teams and to other key contributors, not on the advisory board, but who also made a major impact. I can also see some of you here in the audience. And of course, thank you to Mark Carney, Ekosuehi Yahen, and Yusef Nase from the UNFCCC for providing such strong forwards. Now, I wouldn't be here myself without my stellar home team. Thank you with all my heart to Rowan Douglas for envisaging the idea of this project and for giving all the weekends of this year to working on it together. And our children also here with us, Rebecca and Sergio, who also had to compromise their weekends and you did so with such grace, understanding, and commitment to the four of us being a team. You even did some of the graphic designing in the early, earlier draft. It's the biggest privilege of our lives being your parents. Now, as Bronwyn mentioned, we have identified 20 actions across risk quantification priorities for the insurance sector and for the wider financial sector, and also risk sharing priorities for resilience, net zero, and a just transition to resilience and to net zero for all. We have summarized the actions into five recommendations for COP26 which I will be referring to in a moment, and Nigel will unpack in a more specific way in his intervention. We all together face a collective risk management challenge within countries and across countries. To manage climate risks properly, we have to share them and we have to share them at a scale, urgently. Unfortunately, 
risk, share, risk sharing systems are often overlooked. We have aimed to correct that with this work that we are launching here at COP26. Insurance and wider financial regulation hold the key, but only policymakers can turn it to unlock all its power with the policy signals and the mandates that they give regulators to work on. We have identified the, these mandates and docking points for the necessary policy signals. Risk sharing can help govern, manage, and reduce climate risks. Risk, and in fact, it represents approximately one third of the global 80 trillion US dollars the GDP. They include tax-based social protection, informal community risk sharing, and the insurance sector, public, private, and mutual, the premium-based risk sharing. They are often risk sharing systems in this wide spectrum. They are often the understated giant of our societies. They sit amongst our significant cultural and economic assets. However, their distribution is highly uneven. Sustainable Development Goals 1 and 8 commit to changing that, asking for social protection for all, and as well as an expansion to insurance, of insurance. And even where risk sharing systems, public and private, exist significantly, the response allocated to climate risks is only puny and tentative. This has to change urgently. To do so, we propose two paradigm shifts. One, insurance risk quantification across the public and private financial systems. To share climate risks at a scale, they must be measured consistently. Within risk sharing systems, the insurance sector has unique risk quantification and management skills overseen by regulation. We propose these approaches spread across the wider financial regulation from microfinance to global financial institutions to achieve a climate smart financial system. Emphasizing this, we have a video from one of our advisory board members. It's Dr. Fernando Restoy. He's the chair of the Financial, Financial Stability Institute at the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. Let me start by congratulating the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership for publishing the report. It is my great pleasure to say a few words to mark this occasion. It is fair to say that consensus has been reached on the urgency of taking action to address climate change, and what follows is precisely the need for intellectual guidance on how best deploy available instruments. This report makes a convincing case that both the public and the private sector have a role to play to better identify, measure, manage, and reduce financial risks stemming from climate change. In particular, the insurance industry, as a key part of the existing risk sharing and risk pooling mechanisms, had developed procedures and techniques for risk quantification and governance that could be helpful more generally to shape the private and public response to challenges posed by climate developments. The report also stresses that the financial sector has a clear role to play in order to facilitate the huge reallocation of resources that the transition to a more sustainable economy will require and to facilitate minimization of the existing protection gap. Financial regulation may therefore need to be adjusted to ascertain that institutions are ready to play that crucial role. That implies both ensuring sufficient coverage of climate-related financial risks that institutions keep on their balance sheet, 
and providing the right incentives to align financial institutions' behavior with the broad social goals. In sum, this report does not only tell us what to do, but it also makes relevant inroads on the more challenging task of telling us how to do it. So Fernando has been emphasizing a non-insurance person from other parts of the financial system is emphasizing this idea of what insurance-informed risk quantification has to offer to the rest of the financial system. That was the first paradigm shift that we are proposing. The second paradigm shift is expanding risk climate, risk sharing across the public and private financial systems beyond the insurance. Risk quantification and awareness is not enough. Once we know where the risk is and who it falls on, individuals, organizations, governments, we must share it at a scale. A, wide, a widespread application of risk sharing pools will benefit populations and economies in two very significant ways. One, protecting greater, greater numbers of people and assets straight away from physical and transition-related climate risks. The other uh, benefit, stewarding the behaviors of individuals, society, and capital. Sustainable risk-sharing pools provide practical and flexible governance mechanisms for a tra just transition to resilience and net zero. Ultimately, all the actors of the risk-sharing domain, tax-based tax and premium-based, should work in a public, private, and mutual risk-sharing continuum operating within countries and among countries, supporting each other. We have now a video from Thomas Soleil. He's the General Insurance Superintendent of Costa Rica, President of the Latin American Association of Insurance Supervisors, and Chairman of the Inclusion, Financial Inclusion Forum at the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. Thank you, Anna, and hello, COP26. Please receive a special greeting from Costa Rica. I am very excited about the contents of this working paper and its recommendations. For me, it's an honor to address these words and pointing out the sense of urgency on climate action, but especially the sense of urgency on closing protection gap to build a more resilient world and stop people's suffering. In my opinion, insurance is one of the few tools available, if not the only one, to achieve a just transition on climate goals. Nevertheless, the protection gap is still huge. Actually, while this event is taking place, more than 4 billion people around the world are highly underprotected against natural catastrophes risks, as we reported some weeks ago. In the other hand, 76% of global natural catastrophe exposures are unprotected. But even more, for emerging economies, no protected catastrophe losses are rise at more than 90%. So, in this context, we must agree with Cambridge report when it warns us that we have a growing insurance emergency as well as a climate emergency. Let me elaborate a little. In the context of an insurance protection gap, there are key roles that insurance regulators play in promoting greater financial inclusion and sustainability. Regulatory support for inclusive insurance is an essential element to address physical and transition risk. Closing the protection gap faced by communities in the climate emergency is a strategic and necessary action to build a safer and more resilient world. I believe that insurance regulators 
will play a critical role in that objective. Not giving the public policy, this is a government's responsibility, but actively supporting the action. For that reason, I fully support and celebrate the first recommendation for COP26 to reinforce financial inclusion and sustainable development priorities within insurance regulators' mandates. Thank you. I back to you, Anna. We are very grateful to Thomas. Not all the regulators are prepared to categorically ask for development mandates. Development mandates allow to explicitly include a duty to reach to the underinsured or the not protected at all. And this is linked to another key recommendation that we bring to COP26. We need insurance and wider risk-sharing targets to form a significant part of national adaptation plans, including support from the Green Climate Fund, this 100 billion currently being negotiated amongst governments that we keep hearing about. We will be tomorrow in the blue zone at COP26 bringing this message. Insurance and wider risk-sharing targets should be a significant part of national adaptation plans. Co-author Nigel will speak in a moment, but it is my pleasure now to invite Dominic Christian, who has to leave quite shortly. Dominic Christian is the global chairman of Reinsurance Solutions at AEON and the chairman of ClimateWise at the University of Cambridge. He has been a very active member of our advisory board for this call to action in this report, helping us at key stages of the review and input process. In fact, you just heard regulator Thomas uh, quoting the report that in the climate emergency, we have an insurance emergency. That comes from Dominic. Dominic, please. So those of you who, who know me will be relieved that it's only a couple of minutes um, from me. But um, Anna Bronwyn, uh, Anna's family, uh, Rowan, thank you so much to say thank you to the council, of course. Fabulous, fabulous place. Um, Kevin, just so you know, in terms of meeting famous people, true story. I met someone today who had met someone yesterday who the previous day had met Bill Gates. So, you know, you're pretty close to that. So you can say that today. Uh, fact, but if I think this document, I've been working or thinking about the subjects of climate for about 33 years, uh, at least in my professional life. Uh, and I think this is the best document I've ever seen to describe it. I think it's a masterpiece. Uh, and I say that both as climate-wise, I say it as Aeon. Uh, and let me tell you why, because when I was reading it over the weekend, and believe me, I have nothing to do with it. Um, you know, that's the 80 pages. So then I got my notes. You know when you're trying to pre-share or just do a sort of little note on something? Well, there's the 26 pages of notes that I took from that, all of which are intensely valuable. And they will be kept with me on my travels, because I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's an absolute... Um, it's an education, it's a work. Um, some of you who work in insurance, or at least reinsurance, will have heard of a guy called R.J. Kiln, and what he wrote is the sort of Bible of reinsurance. This will be the Bible of, to me, climate going forward. I think I would recommend it to anyone. And it covers so many themes so extraordinarily quickly. Um, it's education it covers, and you refer to the uh, Global Training Alliance, which I think is going to be so important. When we, as insurers, speak to clients, we need to do it in a much more effective way. What I mean by that is when you're talking to a sophisticated multinational company about climate, it's a very different discussion to talking to my neighbour in Norfolk about climate. So we have to sort of think of ways where we can help others know what we know. 
So that's the first bit. And I, I think you bring it out beautifully in it. You also bring out what we do well, very, very effectively. And we don't, and it's the chair of the council, the leader of the council, Susan Aitken, made the point that we don't raise our voice as we ought to. And I know people like Nick feel strongly in this as well. We don't. And you've helped us do that through this document. Believe me, it's going to be in all sorts of desks around the world, that is for sure, and in all sorts of folders. Um, so we don't shout loud enough, so that's in there as well. You also bring across this very important point of compartmentalisation. You know, we in our industry, when you think of weather perils and the effects of them, we probably have a pretty good handle on hurricanes and earthquakes. We have less of a handle on wildfire. We have less of a handle on drought. We have less of a handle on flood. Rowan and I have discussed this a lot. Um, so we've got to say what we're good at, and we've got to say what we can improve at, uh, and actually you bring that across beautifully as well. And actually then you bring across, which is always an interesting uh, and bold uh, in a document, you bring across the role of the regulator. So critical, and there are lots of regulators who've contributed to this document. I hope you keep them together, Anna. I really do, because it's so good. So for me, it's a tremendous piece of work. It is proactive rather than reactive. You make that point, of course. And if you work in the industry, it's a reminder. If you don't, it's a revelation. But to all of you, it will resonate. So thank you so much to all of you. Thank you very much to those who contributed. Thank you for allowing me to be with you for a couple of minutes or so. I'm sorry that I have to go and people watch somewhere else. But thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dominic, for those words. Goodness me, you have given us now a call to action yourself. And uh, we have now, uh, this, in this Cam uh, Cambridge in general, the University of Cambridge in general, our department in particular, the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, excels at creating partnerships between academia, industry, and policymakers. So this report, this call to action, is one of those examples, not only through the advisory board of 20 different uh, heads of prominent institutions that we have had contributing to it, but also our co-authors. So we have uh, Nigel representing from Clyde & Co, representing uh, industry, and Jeff Summerhays representing regulation. Uh, Jeff is in Australia, stranded by COVID uh, restrictions, unfortunately, but he has sent us this video, after which we will have Nigel's intervention. Hello, COP26. My name is Jeff Summerhays. The implications from the global economy shifting to a low carbon future are unprecedented and far reaching. Our COP26 mission on risk sharing is a call to action underpinned by 20 recommendations for the insurance sector and financial services. As a former Prudential Regulator, Chair of the Sustainable Insurance Forum, Executive Committee Member of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors and its Sustainability Champion, I offer the following observations. Firstly, the insurance sector and its regulators have been leaders when it comes to raising awareness and action on climate change financial risk. While there has been significant progress, regulators and insurers' work has only just begun. There is a need to go further and quickly to ensure financial stability. And finally, to achieve net zero in the global economy, Every country, every sector and every community needs to realign with this end in mind. Financial markets are the arteries of this transition. My co-authors, Anna, Nigel and I, with the support of the Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership, present a call to action for the insurance sector. As a former regulator, I wish to highlight the following recommendations for global standard setting bodies, policymakers and regulators. Firstly, rethink regulatory time horizons to align with the transition pathway. Shift risk assessment from short term to intergenerational. Use insights from insurers and regulators to highlight the potential impact of physical, transition and liability risks for the economy and society. Strengthen regulators' climate-related mandates to enable these shifts. 
increased data sharing across insurance and financial services, especially with banking, to improve decision making. Mandate TCFD disclosure. Require regulators to assess and serve the uninsured market so society is better informed about community exposure. Policymakers and regulators should remove impediments for infrastructure investments in a low carbon future. Regulators should require insurers to set carbon budgets at an underwriting level. And finally, upscale the investment of insurers in the green economy and the transition from brown to green. Time has run out for encouragement and support of words. Policymakers and regulators need to go further and act quickly to ensure financial stability. I commend our paper and its recommendations to the conference. Thank you. So as Anna and Jeff have summarized, we've got a wide ranging report with 20 recommended actions aimed at policymakers, at uh, insurance supervisors, and at the insurance industry itself. What I'm gonna do briefly is summarize particular actions that are most relevant to the insurance industry. So if we begin with underwriting, we're recommending that underwriters proactively engage with um, the measures that are needed to uh, achieve a resilient net zero world. So that could include discounted premiums for taking resilience measures. It could mean uh, offering insurance solutions to decommissioning of brown assets or scaling up the new technologies we vitally need, such as carbon capture, use and storage, or the, the whole hydrogen economy that has to be grown from its small beginnings. The uh, ClimateWise has identified a number of ways in which the insurance industry can get involved and uh, efforts to mitigate emissions. Also, the uh, Net Zero Insurers Alliance, which is growing rapidly, are showing the way in this regard. And insurance supervisors could play a vital role here uh, by enabling and encouraging innovation, which might include public-private collaboration. So that's the underwriting side. On the investment side, uh, today, resilient, low-carbon infrastructure represents less than 2.5% of invested capital. Less than 2.5%. We're recommending a rebalancing of policy so that insurers can allocate more of their funds to this class, but at the same time, of course, doing it in a way that's consistent with risk and liquidity requirements. Then climate disclosure. There's a lot in the report about this. So in the UK now, and increasingly in other countries, insurers are going to be called upon to disclose their climate-related physical transition and liability uh, exposures. Uh, when rigorous methods, metrics, and data are available, and developed to quantify these risks, we recommend that current climate risks are incorporated into insurers' capital requirements. But climate risk assessment, as Jeff mentioned, has to adopt a long-term, in fact, an intergenerational timescale. That's most obvious for life and pensions carriers, but general insurers too could have long-term climate exposure through their duties as fiduciaries and through liability policies, which can pick up liability for historic acts. So this longer perspective calls for a dialogue among life and pensions carriers, general insurers, and their respective investment teams, who can pool their expertise in actuarial analysis, natural catastrophe modeling, and so on. Looking further down the road, once the metrics are established, we can foresee insurers being required to disclose not only the climate risk they face, but also the carbon load of their underwriting portfolios in a standardized way across different classes of business and geographies and to lay out their carbon appetite and strategy. Supervisors could then aggregate this data to map trends in global carbon intensities and assess whether they align with Paris and the related science-based targets. 
and then building on that, insurers and insurance regulators could develop a system of annual carbon underwriting budgets. The resulting constraints on capacity would make it progressively harder for high carbon emitters to arrange insurance if they aren't taking meaningful steps to reduce emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. Looking briefly to the wider financial sector, so including banking and investment. Um, so taking their cue from the insurance industry, we recommend that this wider financial sector also be required to disclose and manage their own contingent climate liabilities to ensure their capital adequacy. Insurance regulators could help their counterparts elsewhere in the financial sector to develop these new requirements. And when the contingent climate-related exposure embedded in transactions, assets, and portfolios is revealed, that could lead to millions of lives and trillions of dollars being protected by parametric and indemnitary instruments, supported by capital markets, the insurance industry, public agencies, and hybrid solutions. And then in future, the Financial Stability Board could publish an annual global report assessing the potential risks and resilience of the entire financial system to climate risks under current and future scenarios. And that assessment could include the extent, the impact, and the security of climate insurance. To sum up then, these and the other recommended actions in the report would allow insurers underwriting, their investment portfolios, and their highly developed risk expertise to play a greatly expanded role in a just transition to a climate resilient net zero world. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Wilson, uh, Director of Climate Change at the ABI. I want to start by thanking Glasgow City Council and uh, Susan for hosting us, and thank ClimateWise for the opportunity uh, to partner at the launch of such a thought-provoking um, event. Uh, the, the ABI is proud to have been a founding member and part of CISL's ClimateWise since 2007, and today's report, I think, demonstrates why it's more important than ever. Um, I, you know, it's, it's lovely also, I think, to see Anna's sort of family here today. Um, I, I did ask my sort of daughter if she wanted to come up uh, and, and see me speak, but she sort of said that she thought I was going to be a bit boring. So um, I'll let you kind of be the judge of that. Um, but Rowan and Anna, I'll be following up with some sort of parenting advice uh, after this later on today. And in, in researching previous COPs, I found a report from US President Lyndon Johnson's Science Committee in 1965, which stated, rising levels of carbon may be sufficient to create marked changes in climate that could be deleterious from the point of view of human beings. I think deleterious isn't a word that's used very often anymore, but it certainly doesn't sound um, very good. Um, it's also easy to get downbeat that I think 56 years later we're still staring down the barrel of the climate change gun. But I think international efforts to combat climate change have produced more than a, a thicket of acronyms, most recently GFANS or NZIA. They, they are products, I think, of a, a, a kind of remarkable consensus that we're all seeing uh, as, you know, very much as being part of this COP about the need to cooperate on a scale never seen before. Climate change is happening now, and more than most sectors, the insurance and long-term savings industry knows it. Our role in helping society absorb financial shocks when disasters happen means we've always been on the front line, and we see firsthand the more frequent and severe weather events. Globally this year, there were 416 natural catastrophe events costing $268 billion, 8% above average annual losses this century. I think nobody attending COP needs reminding of the scale of the climate challenge. But it is worth stressing, we understand that it represents an existential threat, not just to the planet, but to our industry itself. A business as usual approach to climate will destroy the insurance business model. 
It's not that insurers will be unable to pr price the risk. There will simply be too much risk in the system for the average person to afford much of what we sell. That is clearly not a good scenario for our sector. Without decisive action to meet the Paris goals, no amount of adaptation or risk sharing will provide society with the protection needed. In, in comments previewing COP26, Boris Johnson ta talked about team world being 5-1 down at half time. To adopt the sporting metaphor, I think the insurance sector can be the sort of star player, uh, a Ronaldo or a Raducanu, if you like, in this comeback to preserve civilization. That's because of its unique and wide-ranging set of contributions in every field of play. As defenders or goalkeepers through our central role as risk managers, as creative midfielders innovating through green products or de-risking the investments of others through underwriting, as team managers through the transformational role we can play through engagement and stewardship, and as goal scorers, institutional investors who make match-winning contributions by funding green technologies and renewable energy. We, we are amongst a small handful of sectors who can be the biggest change makers. The moral and the business case is clear, and governments, regulators, our staff, and most importantly our customers, demand it. That's why a, a group of 10 leading CEOs from the UK's insurance and long-term savings sector came together this year to agree our climate change roadmap. It sets milestones we need to meet by 2025, a 2030 goal of 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and the ultimate goal of reaching net zero by 2050. It was the first National Insurance Trade Association plan of its kind. It was endorsed by Mark Carney, UK and Scottish governments, the WF, as well as our long-standing um, partners, uh, ClimateWise, which we're particularly grateful for. And since then, it has received worldwide interest, Italy, Australia, Holland, elsewhere. We encourage all firms to join leading ABI members in signing up to the UN's Race to Zero, backed by science-based targets. But it also means publishing transition plans. We know that target setting is only a first step. Uh, so there's much, as much transparency about actions being taken now as future targets. And obviously, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that that's been a major theme of what Rishi Sunak and Mark Carney have been talking about today. We supported the WWF's campaign to make published transition plans mandatory and welcome the UK government's confirmation that this will be put into law. An effective transition plan must be based around responsible stewardship of capital. Our members hold 1.6 trillion in assets. That's why the work and pension secretary, Therese Coffey, last week called UK pensions and insurance a superpower in the net zero race. Whether it's monitoring and engagement strategies, escalation and collaboration with other investors, or exercising shareholder rights, ABI members providing retirement products in particular have been at the forefront of the stewardship agenda. I think this provides experience that the wider insurance sector can learn from, particularly uh, with the um, advent of the Net, Net Zero Insurance Alliance, uh, a body that the ABI is committed to working with and supporting. Of course, it's not possible for the insurance sector, as I think sort of Anna and other speakers have said, um, to do this on our own. Um, we're big, but we're dealing with unquestionably the world's biggest potential market failure. Um, physical risk is manifesting today, and we can't correct that market failure. We need those who structure the market, governments, regulators, policymakers, to help do that. We need significant interventions from government and regulators. As Anna, Anna's report says, there must be a sustained focus on building the quality and consistency of data. There's a constantly changing, confusing, and opaque world of standards out there. As an ABI, we'll continue to push for this to be prioritised globally. Um, the adoption of TCFD is a welcome first step, but this has to be an adaptive process that provides practical information for those making investment and underwriting decisions. For the UK to meet its 2035 target of a 78% reduction in emissions, 2.7 trillion of investment is needed. ABI research has found that our members could invest as much as 0.9 trillion equivalent to one-third or 60 billion a year. Our sector is a long-term investor and should be the ideal partner to deliver the patient capital needed. 
but this will require significant regulatory and market reform to unlock. Regulators need to work closely with the UK Infrastructure Bank, government energy experts and the Environment Agencies, so investment re reaches where it's needed most. Then there are some specific reforms we should focus on. For example, reforming the prudential regulatory regime, the um, catchily titled Solvency II Matching Adjustment, which could free up 95 billion from the UK's long-term savings sector. We also need to recast past part of the international financial architecture. We agree with GFANS, I think it's called GFANS, or the GFANZ, I, I never know, that we must price the externality of carbon emissions we don't have a global system where polluter industries pay. The IMF has said recently only one-fifth of global emissions are covered by carbon pricing, and this is money that can be reinvested in a green and just transition. And there are other areas where our, I think our sector can make a real uh, significant, play a significant leadership role. A firm that focuses on home and motor insurance, for example, has up to 90% of its scope three emissions in its supply chain. By requiring high standards from suppliers, our industry can drive major change. And we can also help society adapt. Our customers will face significant choices about making their homes more energy efficient, replacing boilers, and switching to an electric vehicle. Often they will face that choice at the point they make an insurance claim. Our sector needs network, networks of skilled engineers and the right pipeline and market for replacement parts and services. Whether it's electric vehicles, green homes or energy, we can drive behaviour change and create a more circular economy. Uh, today's report rightly emphasises the need for wider risk sharing, which will mean our sector working with government and, and the wider economy. There are precedents for successful public-private risk sharing arrangements. Um, the UK's flood risk scheme, which I know there are representatives um, in the audience with us here today, was, a, was painstakingly negotiated between the ABI government and others over several years and was a genuine world first. Since its launch, it's helped 300,000 households at high risk of flooding secure affordable insurance. However, our experience with floodery is also a reminder that we should not underestimate the significant challenges. It took 62 different regulatory approvals in order for it to become operational over several years. It's a critical part of the puzzle given the growing global protection gap, particularly in climate vulnerable and poorer nations, but it's also important um, to acknowledge the complexities. Uh, to wrap up, our roadmap will need to be constantly updated. As Alok Sharma said, we, need, we all need to show ever increasing ambition in this, in this decade ahead. The ABI strategies and pledges will need to be turned into concrete actions and hard data. But my experience working uh, with CEOs uh, and uh, a number of your companies who we've worked with in the audience gives me great optimism for three reasons. Firstly, I think hands CEOs are really, really hands-on in driving this agenda. One of our industry CEO, uh, CEOs has spoken in, in public forums like this about spending more than 25% of their time working on climate change and sustainability. Second, and I think as demonstrated in our roadmap, there's a real desire to take action and be accountable now, not setting targets for CEO successes to meet. Um, you know, I think we're all aware of that, that sort of um, sleight of hand that can be played um, from time to time. Third, setting out such an ambitious vision for our sector. You know, our, our roadmap really goes beyond the sort of bog standard insurance role, protection against financial loss, using every lever to drive change. Of course, the challenge remains huge. We're headed for 2.7 degrees of warming, which um, I reference my daughter, but I do lose, lose sleep over. Uh, our sector is incredibly influential. Nobody knows yet whether we will pull it off, but we definitely can't do that if too many people sit on the sidelines. Um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm relatively new to the sector, but I'd say it's a, an important terrifying, nail-biting, but also a really exciting time to be part of this industry and our society. And the ABI and its members will do everything they can, working with ClimateWise and the inspirational interventions we've seen through the report today, to do everything we can to raise, rise to this challenge. Thank you.
very much to, to the authors and to Ben. Um, great, great opening speech. I'm now going to call on uh, Anna and Nigel and Ben Howarth, also from the ABI and the climate, uh, climate change team, to have a, a, uh, five or ten minutes of questions, uh, so your reflections on the report before we, before we wrap up. Uh, well, we just wanted to say that the reason that we believe in our parents' work so much is because we've seen with our own eyes how much of a difference it makes to people's lives. For example, um, when our parents were doing their previous CISL report, uh, we went with them to the Philippines to work with communities that have been devastated by the Typhoon Haiyan. Yes, and while our mother was conducting the interviews, we played with the children of those families, made friends, and just saw the massive difference insurance made to them to be able to rebuild their lives after being devastated by the typhoon. And in their day-to-day -day lives, we also saw that children go to their, well, go with their parents to pay to, um, their insurance premiums. And it's, um, and it's just, um, well, it's, in, well, it's really eye-opening to see that, that children are getting involved in it because they have so much knowledge. They knew... They just knew so much more than we do in this country about, about just the power of insurance. In, and we really want this to make a change because, because, I th because this can change the world. Thank you very much. Brilliant intervention. I, I'm, I'm going to take that as a, a cue back to actually that, that point on the, the Philippines and the interviewing yeah. in the mutual microinsurance. So I'm curious if within the report and or, or the ABI's work as well, where the developing world context really sits uh, and if there's particular calls within the actions that are more focused there, which would you be prioritising versus, say, in a location more like the UK here? Well, the, so the developing world sits indeed very strongly in this report because we are calling for an expansion of risk sharing within countries but also among countries. And one of the key messages that we bring to COP26 and particularly tomorrow with a more specialised international policy maker audience we will be uh, highlighting the importance of having serious, life-changing, risk-sharing targets within national adaptation plans, and that includes uh, resources from the Green Fund, if necessary, to help to then uh, just help individuals that are not able to afford themselves the amount of risk they are facing for governments as well to intervene with the private sector or with the, including the mutual and community sector, where Rebecca and Sergio were just referring to just now. And it's just this is what we really mean, that we have to go beyond individual projects into a serious public-private risk-sharing continuum is the only way to manage the amount of risk we are facing and the people are already being uh, victims of, of in a very serious level. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. I think I'd, I'd probably add one of the things that struck me in uh, reflection from the report was the emphasis on data. Which obviously yeah. doesn't manage to cover yeah. everything that's in the report today because it's quite long, but... Um, I think that's a really important part of using um, credible data that we have uh, in order to demonstrate actual product value from insurance. Um, and I think, you know, when you were talking earlier, you talked a lot about underwriting, but I think claims is absolutely critical to this and able to demonstrate to people that the products that they're buying in or investing in, if it's a public par private partnership, are going to deliver value. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really part to get the engagement and to make people feel that they're going to get something back. We know in this room that 
insurance can play a vital role when you suffer a catastrophe. And I think we also know that climate change risk is going to change to being something that's probably quite a steady state of risk for a lot of people. Not just we're not just talking about hurricanes when they go when things go absolutely wrong, but it's going to play quite a regular ticking role. So I think that's really important. Andrew, do you have yeah. any sort of comments on the, the data side or the? I think that this um, there's a big theme of the paper: the, the public-private intersection and what insurance methodology and thinking and products can bring to the party here. There's, there's already good examples in sub-Saharan Africa, in the Philippines, yeah. in the Caribbean and so on, uh, of this working. We're also now beginning to see uh, natural assets being uh, covered uh, as well. And so it's, it's a matter of public funding, um, but also sharing of data between the two sectors, uh, as, as you've said earlier, Ben. Um, this is one of the themes in the paper, data pooling through um, data trusts and so on, which would inform this risk sharing, but also inform broader policy decisions, um, what building decisions to make, how, whether you should use scarce dollars to build physical resilience or um, use it to purchase uh, contingent cover. Yes, and actually, it's just building on uh, Ben's point on the community involvement. This is something that we dedicated two years in, uh, at CISL, at the University of Cambridge, and we worked very actively with these communities in the Philippines, but that is just comparable to so many other places around the world, including uh, our this country. And... Um, one, it, it was actually the first study to map as well insurance functions and, uh, and uh, capabilities to all the sustainable development goals. And one of the key aspects that was so dis distinctive in these, in these communities that we were working with is the, the, exactly the community involvement as uh, what Rebecca and Sergio were referring to, it was not just only about recovering a, a, a time of disaster, it was the everyday life, people living, these were people living, living just above the poverty line, and they would meet every week in their community we, uh, meetings to just pay their premiums, but also build a lot of resilience around that, around that meeting. So they would be, there would be disaster risk reduction, uh, financial education. So these people didn't only de depend on disaster to strike to see the value of insurance. They already got so much out of it that made them part of the financial system and made them resilient, independent people. And this is, uh, so this organization covered about 20 million people in the Philippines. We are not talking about a little case study, but and this really shows, you see, if it can be done in a place like Tacloban, in the shadow of Typhoon Haiyan, surely with private and public and community effort, this can be replicated everywhere else. Thank you. Can I check at this time? Uh, sorry. W would someone mind helping out with the microphone? Sorry. It's just down here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, Steve Weinstein from the Bermuda Insurance Market. So great to be here and to see for all of you. One quick comment. The young experts in the front just gave the best commercial for insurance and reinsurance I've heard in 30 years. So that was really inspiring. Thank you for that and thank you for the leadership I know is going to come out of your generation in years to come. For the panel, I wonder if you can comment a little bit more on some of the appetite you heard in your work up to this great paper on the appetite in the market as insurers and reinsurers move from closing what we think of as the traditional insured protection gap to the climate protection gap? And what are some of the products that you have heard about or think are on the horizon that might be uh, brought to market to provide some more solutions? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Steve. We are seeing a, a step change in appetite 
that this has really, truly really changed over the last five years. Uh, I think there's been a long realization about the general protection gap, but I think it's only really now coming to sharp focus the climate related protection gap, which most clearly manifests itself, of course, in disasters. Uh, but, but, but there is a more general one there. There's more appetite, I think, for insurers to get involved in public private partnerships, which, which is key here. We, we, this is very difficult, I think, for insurers to do solo going into countries like this where they have no. Um, network, no delivery mechanism. So working with the, uh, the governments, with uh, humanitarian agencies and other stakeholders to, to deliver these. And I think this, yeah, the, it is really taking off now, the, the, this, this engagement here. Um, not simply viewing this as a commercial opportunity, though I think there are some in, embedded in this, but, but actually seeing this as part of the insurance industry's role in making the world more resilient. And I, I do see that, that, I think in this decade, we can see a lot, lot more of this, but it does need a lot more of these um, convening through, through the Insurance Development Forum uh, would, would be the best way, but, but through other forums to bring these, these willing parties together. Yes, and I could say is our advisory board and the selection of these institutions that we had just coming together and mm. cooperating in this panel, it really, so we had industry, but the regulators and policy makers, and just the need to just break down these barriers. I, I, we saw, and Bronwyn, you, uh, I'm sure you'd like to come in here as well, representing, so you lead climate-wise, you are dealing with insurers, insurers all the time, and these, just, uh, these, these collaborative opportunities to just break down the barriers, to break down the regulatory obstacles that we face, the, just the, the, pre, the prejudice that sometimes other actors like governments or the humanitarian sector, other, other, other people involved in this space in paying the bills left behind in the protection gap. There is a lot of work as well to also just break those uh, preconceptions and, and sometimes negative preconceptions about the insurance industry. Uh, Bronco, is this from, from your experience of living climate wise? I'm sure you can contribute uh, here with also great insights. Yeah, so I, I think I understand the question is about the collaboration that you're seeing and I think the openness of the industry to try and learn from each other has definitely grown a lot. Um, the Climate Wise membership itself has grown, grown dramatically and we're seeing the new initiatives like the Sustainable Markets Initiative Insurance Task Force. So you're seeing a lot of focus on what can we do together um, and trying to do as much as you can in that kind of pilot pre-competitive space um, because you also know that you're going to need to develop your in-house capabilities. So there's, I think, a lot of openness in the market to communication because they know it's going to need to go in-house and change how they work. Um, I think there's also a lot of kind of cross um, collaboration, so between the regulators and the firms, so more like say what was happening in the UK here with the, um, I'm back in this acronym soup of, as Ben mentions, um, the, the CFRF, where you're bringing regulators and business right in next to each other to have conversations around how we do this better. So within CIS, so we're, we're framing this as we're looking for radical collaboration, so looking for something that's beyond just kind of talking to your peers, but also then talking to outside of your box and, and where can you really bring, bring in new voices. And I'd, I'd hear sort of particularly from the ABI and, and where your collaborations are taking you as well. Yeah, definitely, completely agree with that. I think, um, as Ben mentioned, our CEOs have been really hands-on with our work. I don't think we would have had that even a couple of years ago. I think what we've probably seen is a kind of galvanising effect from regulators. I think in the UK, the regulators have been pretty proactive, um, which has then fed into much more ambition from firms. I think also, if you look at the sort of ambition about the products, um, as long as I've been at the ABI, people have talked about a desire to sort of move beyond traditional models of insurance where you, you know, shop around for premiums and it's all about price um, and to look at something that's much more about adaptive risk management. Um, and I think in climate change, though, I think it's an oversimplification to see climate change as an opportunity. It's potentially a disaster for the world. But um, if you are, want to look for the opportunities, I think that ability to look at adaptive risk management and some of the ideas and concepts that are in the port is where the opportunities are. So that's definitely what we're seeing. Thank you.
Now, I might move us more towards the informal questions. Oh, Tony, you wanted to sneak in. I just asked about parametric insurance and how that fits into risk sharing as well, particularly in the building back. I hate to use this because I'll get accused of blah, blah, blah. Um, but building back better. Yeah, well, uh, this is also where we go back to this premise that we emphasize, and it's just such a, such a good question. I have uh, worked myself on a project in uh, Kenya and Tanzania, pre precisely dealing with this issue. And um, it is, we go back to this thing about uh, government involvement and community involvement. And these three elements of the insurer, the government, and the community, they have to be partners. They, it won't work otherwise. And uh, in our report, we are very strong about parametric, parametric insurance. And being, uh, Nigel mentioned that in his speech, is really just the, the, the gateway to truly spread risk across the financial system in many ways. But yes, the right policies engaging the community, they have to be in place both from a government money, either national or donor, there is a lot of talk in this space right now, to just build back better, but also the communities themselves. I think it's uh, yeah, building on what Anna said. I think this is about thinking beyond a product, in this case, parametric insurance, and looking at a solution. So in this case, you're trying to make a community more resilient against whatever it might be, um, acute rainfall, heat, or whatever. But if this happens, you want to ensure not only that the, the instrument responds in the way it's designed to, but that the assets are used in order to achieve the goals. And so it, and in the parts of the world that are most acutely need the help, that absolutely means it has to be embedded in the community, yeah. it has to be actually co-produced by the community, they, they will be best equipped to know what steps need to be taken so that if this bad thing happens, and they, and they do are required to rebuild, what there is rebuilt will be more resilient against the same thing happening again. And um, they'll know how to go about that. So the parametric instrument by itself is simply a means of funding that intervention but the intervention, crucially, is, is, a, is a local intervention with external help. Yes, definitely. So it's in this project I, I was uh, mentioning, or more than project, it was the World Food, led by the World Food Programme, a condition for people to be covered by this parametric instrument was to have drought-resilient uh, seeds. Hmm. And, it, and, like, and also their own involvement as well in just uh, measures that would make them resilient, like digging dams that could help them. So all of this was embedded in the, in the policy and as well even in the regulatory aspects that allow this project to, the, to go ahead or this product to go ahead. I think, the, I think the thing that comes out really strongly yeah. from the report is this isn't a one sector or one product yeah, issue. Exactly. And if you think of it like that, within what it's obviously helpful, look at what your own business can do yeah. first. But actually, each individual part needs to be pointing in the same direction here. And I think that comes out really strongly that you know, if we look at our membership, we've got the long term savings sector are the ones with the massive pools of capital that can invest in the transition. But that's not distinct from the risk. A lot, you know, the earlier we invest in the transition, the more we reduce the risk, both in simple terms that we'll reduce the amount of extreme weather, but actually the quicker that the sort of, well, colleagues from Glasgow Council are talking about all their opportunities, the quicker we get those built and get those to be scaled up so that they're affordable, um, the less financial risk is associated with these. So I think it's really important to have all of this pointing in the same direction rather than thinking, my job is to settle claims when there's a disaster and it's someone else's job to worry about paying for it. I think if we can, and I think this report does that really well, it makes it, you know, across the piece. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, very much agree. And, and I think, yeah, as you say, what we're going to see is a, a much more collaborative and uh, engaged 
uh, insurance industry as a full service supply chain. So I think, as you'll see it within the ClimateWise membership as well, that we're working with, yes, insurers and reinsurers, but really you have to deal with the whole value chain. Where are the modellers sitting? Where are the loss adjusters? How are, how are the building sort of retrofitting pieces fitting in? So that you're looking more at the whole chain of the policy through to the claims payment, as well as the regulatory envelope that it sits inside. So, so I think what we... I'm, I'm, I'm going, just in the interest of time, unfortunately, I'm going to have to um, hold us there. I'm going to mention, um, we've got some, uh, uh, before I pass it to Ben for the thanks, I'm going to mention that we have lunch with us here, but there's also um, physical copies of the report. If anyone is interested, I'm very happy to, to provide. And it sort of links in also on, on the website with some of the previous work uh, by Anna, as well as ClimateWise, um, and the broader Achieving Zero piece that CISL is running at the moment. So thank you, everybody, and I'll, I'll pass to Ben for the... The more formal thanks. I'll, I'll keep this brief. I just wanted to say thank you again for all of you for joining us um, here today. Firstly, I wanted to thank Glasgow City Council again, uh, Susan and Kevin, for hosting us in such a spectacular building and, and surrounding and also to congratulate ClimateWise, Anna and Anne Bronwyn and all those who've worked and contributed for the publication of such an important report. Um, I just sign off by saying um, I wish everyone here a, a really successful COP26. As, as a number of us have said, we need to talk, collaborate, debate, disagree, agree, uh, and cooperate like never before. So I just hope you all make the most of this time up here. You know, it's a, it's a sort of precious space and uh, I hope it, is, it enables you to really sort of move forward and, and uh, contribute in the way that I know you will all want to. So thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of this week.